recovery, so I asked if he might like to share his testimony with you all. And I know you will feel very blessed by hearing from both Robbie first and then Kyle. So I'd like to come on down. Good morning, everybody. <laughs> so it is such an honor to be here. And it's it brings me so much peace and joy. And I'm just in absolute disbelief that Kyle and I are both standing here because we were both truly that man who Jesus saved, the demonic, completely gone man who just said, Lord, please don't hurt me because I'm too far gone and I'm, I'm hopeless. And just to, to come out on the other end just shows me like no matter what anyone's ever going through, we have hope in the Lord. And my journey started about roughly seven years ago when my brother and I's mother died of cancer. And it just hit me so hard that I thought life was so glorious and perfect. And then everything crumbled and I woke up one day thinking, who am I? Lord, if you're real, why would you take my mom? And after completely breaking down, I basically went through this chapter of life where I just didn't know who I was anymore. And my only refuge was drugs. And I thought, okay, if the doctors gave my mother drugs, then I need to go and find the better drugs because it was like a weird situation where our mother did not want drugs. But the doctor said, you're hopeless, and all we have is morphine. So we literally stepped back and said, how could you say she's hopeless? And her, she died for 40 minutes. Her heart stopped, and they said, let her go. Let her go. She's done. And we just prayed over her and said, Lord, please bring her back. Please. And after 40 minutes, she literally woke up, and they were like, oh, my gosh, this is a miracle. And we were like, oh, my gosh. And we got to spend six more months with her in this glorious state of family healing. And it, it changed everything inside of us. And we got to this place where we were like, oh my gosh, we didn't, we didn't even want to spend any time together prior to this situation. Craig, my brother was in Europe. My sister was in Pennsylvania. I was in Indonesia. And the moment our mom got cancer, we were like, shoom, living in a hospital room. And it was outrageous because we thought we loved each other. And then we'd spend all of our days arguing about whose ice cream flavor is more important and why, why I'm smarter than you. And then our mom would say, stop, what are you doing? I'm dying. And then we woke up and we we're like, you're right. We need to learn how to love each other. And then we did and we began to say, okay, Lord, we see that you have given our mom a second chance to show us what it looks like to have a united family. And that was the greatest testimony that we have ever been gifted. And when I lost my train of thought, because after she passed, I just, I was so sad that I lost everything. I got into drugs. I, my brother wouldn't even talk to me. I was sent home to my parents, and they, they were like, oh, you're hopeless. But they held on. They were like, we can't help you. Jesus can, so they dragged me to church. And then slowly but surely, I woke up, and people praised over me, and just, they served me like Jesus did. And I slowly woke up, and when I finally came back to life, I was like, oh my God, you're so good. How could I be so hopeless and so resurrected? And then I was like, okay, now everything's peaches and cream. But then I get calls from Kyle. Kyle's like, hey, I might die, I just overdosed. And I need money, I need housing. And I was like, oh boy, I thought I was done with this world. And God said, hey, if you want to heal the bigger picture, now that you've been redeemed, you have to help others. And when I reached out to Kyle, everyone's like, let him go. If he doesn't want to help himself, you can't help him. And I said, whoa, whoa, whoa. I'm going to do my best because God gave me people who did their best. And I would drag him to work and say, hey, I got work for you. And he'd go, yeah. And then he'd get there and fall asleep. <laughs> and, and then 
slowly but surely, and then he'd, he'd be in and out of consciousness and reality for months and years. And then one day he called me on my road trip back to school, and he's like, I'm like, oh, I don't know if I should answer this. I don't have extra money that I can give him. I can't call my friends for housing right now. I'm too busy with school. And I was like, okay, Lord be with me. Hello? And he's like, bro, I'm sober and I found Jesus. And I was like, what? <laughs> And with that being said, I want to introduce my brother, Kyle. <laughs> hey, good morning, everybody. Good morning, Kyle. Good morning, Kyle. Um, thank you. First of all, I want to thank Jesus, you know, for coming into my life and my salvation. And I want to thank Rob for always being there for me. He was the one friend that always was there for me. A lot of people gave up on me, but Rob never did. And if it wasn't for good friends like that and good family members, uh, I might not be standing here today. But, uh, you know, I want to I wanna start with, there's a scripture, I'm not sure the address, but there's a scripture in the Bible that says, uh, those that have been forgiven much, loveth much. Mm -hmm. And me and Robbie are those kind of people, you know, we have some hairy testimonies. We've been forgiven for a lot of things. Uh, uh, there was all kind of, I jumped into a lot of sin and I had to hit a low, low bottom before I finally decided to turn my life around. Um, I was homeless on the streets for almost eight years, about seven and a half years I was on the streets homeless. Uh, doing every kind of drug you can imagine, every type of way you can do it. And um, hanging out with the wrong people. I was hanging out with some of the Hell's Angels that's here in Santa Rosa. Just, you know, not having anybody to lean on and being out on the streets for so long, you're, you're so lonely, you're so alone, and you feel like, I want somebody to be able to, I want to feel like I have somebody next to me. When your friends and your family kind of give up on you and you're by yourself, you, you, wanna, you want some sort of human connection, you want some sort of contact, so I ended up hanging out with the wrong crowd of people. And I, I felt like, you know, what they were showing me was love, but it, it's this false love, you know. It's really, it's, it's, um, it's a form of manipulation, you know, they want to use you for what you can do for them, and it's really, it, it's, it's not love, but, uh, you know, I was there with them, and we were doing all kinds of drugs, and, you know, like you said, I've OD'd uh, multiple times, I think I've OD'd on heroin probably seven times, my heart came to a complete stop. Four times I had to get revived with the Narcan shot back to life. Uh, I've OD on methamphetamines multiple times. It's nothing short of a miracle that I can stand here and testify to you guys today. And little did I know the whole time it was just God completely had his hand over me. And I, so one morning, I'm gonna, I'm gonna explain the day to you guys that I, I first cried out to God. One morning, I wake up in my tent on top of this hill in the woods, and I and uh, I just look around at my tent, and I'm looking at all this filth that I'm living in, dirty needles, filthy clothes, dirty sleeping bags. I literally, my tent had little holes <clears throat> in it where the rats chewed their way through my tent to eat my crackers and my snacks at nighttime. Sometimes I get woken up in the middle of the night with rats crawling over my sleeping bag. Just absolute filth. I, I had, I was so low, I, did, I just didn't care. You know, I was so sad. So I woke up one morning after being awake for probably like five or six days. I slept for 36 hours straight. And I woke up one morning and looked around at all this filth I'm living in. And I thought in my head of all the friends and family I've lost that have just, just like he said, just said, give up on him. And I thought about the people I was actually hanging out with and how, yeah, they say they have your back as long as you're doing stuff for them, as long as you're helping them somehow. And I just started crying that morning, crying so hard. And I, I remember coming out of my tent and, and I fell down on my knees that day, <coughs> crying. And I didn't, I thought to myself, I've tried this, I've tried that, I've been in institutions, I've been in jail, I've been forced into programs non-secular programs, and I just thought, what, I, you 
you know, family and friends coming up on me. I thought, what can you try, Carl? I don't want to die like this. I don't want to, I don't, I want to one day have a, a home, have a job, have a car, have a wife, possibly children, all the things a normal person desires in life. You know, love, friendship. And I just, ding. It was like this light bulb just went off in my head. And I just thought, you've never tried calling out to God. That's the one thing you haven't tried. And I was just at my wit's end, and I threw my hands up into the air as I'm crying, and I said, look, Lord, if you're up there, and you are truly real, and you love me, please, I, I wanna I wanna stop this. I don't wanna, for some reason, I, I wanna stop doing these things that I'm doing, but I have such a hard time stopping, and I don't understand why. But if you're really real, and you're up there, and you're for me, that I believe that you would have the power to help me stop. So please, if you're there and you're real, show me some sign. Let me feel something right now. Let me feel part of your power so that I can no longer deny your existence. And right then, I'm not kidding you. I woke in, I had woken up sober, right? I was up for days and I slept it off for about 36 hours and I woke up sober. I had no drugs on me. So, and I woke up and the first thing I did was not get high. The first thing I did, I cried and I called out to God. And I can tell you, I swear, when I said, show me your real and let me feel your power, well, all of a sudden, I felt this, this incredible just energy just flowing through my body, like electricity or something. And I stood up and I instantly went from crying and sadness to to having like this feeling of confidence and authority. And I was standing around my friends that are in the Hells Angels and I, and I began seeing these words just <laughs> flashing through my head. And it was like, there was something in my spirit that was telling me, these words are going through your head, son, and, and I want you to speak them out loud, but it's your choice. I'm not gonna force you to, but, but, but I just felt this thing compelling me to want to say these words that are going through my head right now. And I began to tell them, <clears throat> the Alpha, the Omega, you're going to change your ways before you see the end of all days. All this power that you guys desire to obtain through putting fear in people, if you only knew that you could have such unlimited power if you just woke up every morning and thought, what can I do for somebody else instead of using them? And I'm saying these things to these people and they're looking at me like, okay, <laughs> what? Okay, yeah, that's just Kyle. He's crazy. He must have done a shot or something, or I don't know what's going on. And I'm continuing to just, like, I don't know what it is, but I went from crying to having this boldness and this authority and confidence. And I'm telling them with authority, like, you need to change. I'm telling you, you could have so much more power than the power you try to get through fear. And if you just were nice to people and loved them, and then they're starting to tell me, okay, man, you need to just be quiet. But I, I couldn't, something <laughs> Inside of my spirit was like, I can't be quiet. I need to get this out. I need to tell you this. It's something that feels important that I let you know this. So then that whole day, I like, I didn't, at the time I had known nothing about God, nothing about the Bible. Rob was always trying to pull me in the direction of the Lord, but I never for the longest time didn't want to accept it. So I didn't quite know what was happening to me at that time. And, um, so then, you know, I eventually, I, I, after that day, I, it took me a couple more months to get into a program. I bumped my head for a little, only a short while longer after that compared to seven and a half years. It took me two more months after crying out to God to enter a home. And in that two months, I told him, if you're real, show me, right? I said, I want to know you're real. Well, I'm, I've been homeless for seven and a half years. And in those seven and a half years, maybe once, Maybe twice in seven years, somebody came up to me wanting to tell me about Jesus or tell me about the Lord. But in those, from the day I cried out to God, to the, in the, the, that 60 days, from the day I cried out to the day I went into a program, I'm not kidding you, literally all, at least every other day somebody wanted to come up to me and tell me about Jesus. I had hitchhiked from Santa Rosa all the way to Los Angeles, Hollywood, and then to San Diego, close to Tijuana. And I was just roaming the streets, and kind of in Southern California. And I'm on the boardwalk in San Diego, and there's hundreds, maybe thousands of people around me. And I have my heavy 
backpack and I would have been skateboarding, but one of my knees hurt because I fell, so I'm walking with a little bit of a limp. And there was two young ladies out evangelizing from their home church there in San Diego. And I mean, in a crowd of hundreds of people, there's all kinds of homeless people there on the boardwalk. But it's like they see me from like here to the end of that hallway. They see me and it's like there's a target painted on me. And I see them. They're coming straight for me. They're coming straight for me. And I'm like, oh, shoot, I'm looking around. I'm like, they're coming to me right now. And I'm like, okay, okay, just sit here, talk to them, see what they have to say. And they said, hey, you know, I know that I will, uh, we're out here evangelizing with our church. And uh, I just saw it, seen you were hurt. Do you mind if I pray over your knee? I said, sure. Lose. Okay, yeah. And uh, so then she said, do you mind if I touch your knee and say a prayer? I said, well, go ahead. She says a prayer. Dear Lord, you know, I believe you have the power to heal this young man's knee in the name of Jesus. I feel this warm, tingly sensation, and now instantly, boom, right away, my knee felt better. And I wasn't limping anymore. And within 30 seconds, it was straight, the strangest thing, supernatural power right there. So then the next day, I wake up one morning. I'm on the beach, camp on the beach. And I just think to myself, you know, I kind of, this whole God thing is still new to me. I still haven't read the Bible, but all I know is that I woke up broken that morning. I cried out to him, and now he's sending messengers to me. He's sending people to water the seed, right? And uh, so in the next morning, I woke up, and I'm hungry. And I kind of, I, my food stamp card is empty. It was spent for the month, and I don't have any money. And I'm thinking, well, how am I going to eat this morning? I'm real hungry. And... Uh, I just looked up at the sky and I said, all right, you know, God, if you're up there, send me in a direction of where I could get a bite to eat for free. And I walk and I just turn around the corner right there, boom, on the boardwalk. And there's this young man who has a big feast laid out on the table with three of his younger brothers with him. And he just has this big feast, this young Mexican man. And uh, his brothers are all skateboarding. And I walk up and I see him feeding homeless people. And I said, I just felt these goosebumps and these tingles. Like, as soon as I was camping like in a little private spot on the rock jetty, and I said, All right, get up, I stretch, you know, grab my backpack, put it on, and I'm like, I'm hungry, God, if you can send me somewhere with food. I turn the corner, boom, big feast laid out on the table. And I said, I just said, Okay, <laughs> okay, you're doing something right now. I know you're doing something. So I walk up to him. And he's passing out food to some of my other homeless friends there at the boardwalk. And I said, hey, uh, is this okay? He said, yeah, take all you want. Go for it. Yes. And I'm just curious, you know. It's like, okay, God led me to this man, obviously, because I, I said to him, point me in the direction. But then I start to wonder, why is he doing it? Why is he, uh, you know, why would he be doing this? So I asked the man, I said, could, could you mind if I just ask you, why are you out here feeding the homeless people? And he told me, well, you know what? Today's my birthday. And I said, wow, no kidding. Turned 28 years old. And, he's, and I said, oh, wow, and you choose to do this on your birthday? On your birthday with your younger brothers? You know, setting a good example for his siblings. And I said, what made you decide to feed us on your birthday? And he said, looked at me and he says, what's your name? I said, Kyle. He says, you want to know something, Kyle? I says, what? Yeah. He says, you want to know what the best thing about your birthday is? I said, what's that? He says, it's that the Lord gave you another year to live. And that just answered my question right there. He's doing it for God. Because that's what God would do. Just like the story of a man helping this man in despair with the pigs. So I'm like, wow, okay. And then, and then just every day, the next day, I meet a pastor who's doing a sermon on the beach. And he gives me a car to his church. And just every day for those two months, just at, at least every other day, almost every two out of three days, somebody's telling me about Jesus. Or God leads me to, leads me to someone, or God leads someone to me to somehow testify or give me help. And I'm thinking, seven and a half years I've been out on these streets up and down California. And this has never happened to me before and on, on, in the magnitude that it's happening right now. They're just coming like I have this target pain on, on me. They're coming at me left and right wanting to tell me about God or wanting to help me in some sort of way. So I'm thinking, okay, every day my faith is growing a little stronger that, yeah, God, you're real. Okay, you must be real. So eventually, you know, 
eventually I just, I, I start losing my mind, right? I start developing um, paranoid schizophrenia, and I'm seeing things that aren't there, and I'm hearing things that aren't there, and I'm just out of it. And, um, and my father, who's right here sitting in the second row, that's my father, Marty, right there. That's it, you know, that's it. I, I cried out to God, he's proving to me he's real, he's sending me all these helpers. I, I felt his power that day, I asked him to show me the power. Um, you know, and I didn't know what I was doing, but when I got into my church, I belong to the Victory Outreach Church, and we, we specialize in reaching people that come from gang life or uh, addiction. That's our specialty. Wow. So, uh, uh, I called my father that morning and I said, that's it. I, I, I called him and I said, and just like Robbie was on the phone hoping, okay, uh, I'm hoping I don't really have anything. I'm out of town. I don't have any help to give him. Uh, I hope he's not going to ask me for help. Well, I'm calling my dad thinking, oh man, I've said I'm going to do it before. I've, uh, he's put me in programs before that I've failed. And I'm just thinking I'm really serious this time though. And I really mean it. I really hope he helps me with a, a bus ticket back home so I can get help. And I told him, look, Dad, this time, this is not you asking me to go into a program. This is not a judge sentencing me to a program. This is me reaching out to you, telling you I'm serious, and I want to do it this time, and I mean it. I need your help. I'm stuck out here in Southern California. I hitchhiked all the way down here because I was out of my mind crazy. I don't know why I felt like I had to go down there. But, um, Please just wire me the money for a Greyhound bus ticket, and you can pick me up in San Francisco. And I promise you can take me straight to a program. I'm good. I'll go in right now. And he and I'm crossing my fingers, and he's thinking about it. And he said, "You know what? Okay, son, let's do this." And then I just want to thank God for my dad always being there for me and giving me his tools. My dad never gave up on me. You know, he was always there for me. And I love my dad so much. And I was just so happy when he said, yes, we're gonna, I'm going to help you. So we got there. I ended up getting into Victory Outreach. And uh, I just started learning about God and learning about the Bible. And my faith is growing stronger in Jesus Christ every day. And I'm just so happy and so grateful to be saved and be able to testify to you guys today and give you guys hope. It's, it's a blessing to be a blessing. It's a blessing to be saved. And uh, I'll, I'll just close by saying, you know, like Pastor C uh, Cindy said, um, this is a, if there's anything you guys whatever struggle with or that you guys need help with, don't keep it to yourselves. You know, tell somebody. Let somebody know that can help you. Somebody you trust. Somebody you can confide in. Somebody you feel comfortable with. Whatever it may be, big or small, you know. We, me and Robbie happen to have some very intense, traumatic testimonies, and I, I, I didn't share all of it with you. There's a lot of parts that, you know, there's too much to say at all. But uh, whether whatever your struggle is, big or small, I just encourage you to tell one of your brothers or sisters that you can confide in and just let, let somebody help you with it, you know. And I, I pray that you guys are blessed hearing my testimony, and thanks for this opportunity.